Okay, welcome everyone. Today is uh, March 25th and we are going, we are through the history since beginning of last year. So we go through from the very early uh, Confucius time, we talk about the early development of the Chinese philosophy. And today is we almost to the end. Eventually we touch the 20th century. Okay, we call philosopher, but actually he is a writer, a cultural movement a supporter. Okay, so kind of like through the long history, today will be the last one, but that doesn't mean this session will be end. But basically we will take one, one week off and then we will restart. Okay, so let me share the schedule now. So today uh, we talk about Lu Xun's uh, a mad man's diary, and next week we take off. In April, we kind of follow the same path. We will have the Bhagavad Gita, chapter five and the six. And then they have the, before I repeat the history, okay, uh, the, the author I repeat is I follow, not closely follow, but basically use a guideline is Feng Yolan. Uh, I, I, I introduced a few times during the meetup. Uh, he's a short history, so-called short history of Chinese philosophy. So he he has a history of Chinese philosophy, not short, okay, much, much we have a two volume, okay. So I probably will repeat by his not short history of uh, 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 Chinese philosophy. They have some repetition, but they have the more contents. I think uh, I'm more mature okay, through uh, this one. I understand uh, his writing style, what's his attitude much better. And I believe the audience and every participant are probably more familiar now. So it's really the time to go to the real uh, uh, history of Chinese philosophy. So that's what I would like to do probably to the end of this year, but between next week to uh, 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 we started the history of so-called long history. I have a, a few books I'd like to introduce, probably will take about 10 weeks. So one is uh, Feng Yolan have another writing about Zhuang Zi, who is the second Taoist uh, philosopher. And he has uh, 33 chapters. Okay, I'm not going through 33 chapters, but the importance is so-called the inner chapters have a seven chapter. And the Feng Yolan has his own interpretation on these seven chapters. So I will take seven weeks to go through these seven chapters, okay, each, uh, uh, each week, one chapter. Okay, so I think that's one thing I would like to do. And another thing about is the Chinese classic love novels. So um, I find out a book from Professor Xia, who is the modern um, uh, writer uh, from China, but they moved to Taiwan, to Hong Kong. Uh, he talked about six class novel, novels. Okay, so I, okay, so I probably will also introduce this six novel based on Professor Xia's uh, introduction. Okay, so, and the number three, uh, Feng Yolan have another writing called The Spirit of Chinese Philosophy. So he break up a, uh, uh, Cool. He talked about some sin. So he break about like 10 sins. So I think so that's, uh, uh, that's another one I would like to introduce. So uh, before we repeat the history, we have a few things I want to do. Okay, So that's the book and I will have it uh, 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 more organized than I will systematically introduce. Uh, all the, that's why you see all this uh, projected uh, uh, schedule okay, uh, data. Okay. So let's go to today's subject. Okay. So um, today we talk about the um, last week, if you were here, we talk about nine, end of 19th century, uh, early 20th century philosopher, uh, Kang Yu Wei and uh, Liang Qi Chao. Uh, these two person, okay, remember all these person are trained as a Confucian, Confucian scholar. Uh, the, last week, we talked about Kang Yu Wei and Liang Qi Chao. They are, uh, in a way, they understand the Western technology, Western philosophy, Western uh, thought 
are advanced. Chinese have to learn, but they still stand on the Confucianism. So basic, for example, like Kang Youwei, definitely think about Confucius is the great, still a sage. He has is a prophet, he know everything. So we just have to relearn, expand it. Okay. Even more radical people like Liang Qichao, his student, he still say, oh, both are side by side. You know, they have some advantage in Western culture, they have some advantage. Uh, Chinese culture, so both are important. So today we will see, you know, uh, Lu Xun is another person. He totally reject Confucian uh, uh, philosophy. So uh, this, I pick this one as uh, so-called uh, his first novel. Uh, this one is the first novel written, a Chinese novel written in a vernacular Chinese. Okay, so uh, so historically important. And second, he rejects. This one is talking about uh, Confucian society. If you read this one, I don't know how do you think this one, but his purpose is uh, criticize Confucian society. So that's our today. I will, uh, let me see. Okay, I will do a few introduction, okay, about the novel and the global situation. And I talk about Lu Xun, the person, and some, since last time that people, uh, last week people asked about cardinal virtues in Chinese. And I would like to have a few uh, words about cardinal uh, virtues. And I would like to, since this novel is very short and some people even think it's not all the one or just some, no, actually it's complete, it's very short. Uh, so I will, pop, we will probably close read this one, okay, and the chapter by chapter is a 13 chapters. So uh, we will go through each chapter and then we will know what uh, uh, Lu Xun means, okay, on every uh, chapter. And finally, I would like to have, we can have some discussion on this one. And the whole theme is basically, uh, that's my word. I will say Lu Xun is talking about Confucianism is cannibalism. Okay, so that's what he's talking about. It's a savage cannibalism. So, and uh, you can uh, uh, tell me what's, how do you think? You agree, disagree, and if you agree, why Confucianism become uh, cannibalism? So that's what we would like to do. And then, uh, any question, comment before we uh, start? I'm kind oh, of eager. To, I'm, I'm, I'm eager to find out uh, exactly how this relates. Uh, cannibalism relates to Confucianism, and uh, according to Lucian. Okay. And, yeah, this got a very, very interesting topic. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, And then, if you read the Gogol's and the uh, and the Lucian himself admit he write this one after he read Gogol's uh, diary from of a madman. And I believe he also read Gogol's the other one, uh, the nose, talked about the nose, and which will be similar to Lu Xun's another novel called The True Story of RQ. Okay, so uh, they all have their reason to write uh, this novel. So before uh, we read the novel, let me introduce the concept of the, uh, the time during this time, the Date 19th century, early 20th century, so called the uh, modernism movement. And I copy this one from uh, Wikipedia. I think Wikipedia has a pretty good explanation on what is modernism. So it said the modernism is both philosophical and art movement uh, that arose from the broad transformation of Western society during the late 19th century and the early 20th century. The movement reflected a, de a desire for a creation of new form, okay, new form of art. So Picasso is one of the example, uh, 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 philosophy, social organization, and they reflect the newly, uh, newly emerging industrial world, which 
I think the social uh, structure change, including the features such as urbanization, architecture, blah, 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 all everything. So basics, they are considered outdated, okay, for the uh, old tradition. And specifically for the literature, uh, literary modernism, or you want to call it the modernist literature, its origin at the same time, and is characterized by the self-conscious break with traditional way. That's what Lu Xin is doing of writing. The writing style is different, the topic is different, everything is different. So basically it's a conscious uh, desire to overturn traditional modes of representation in, and express the new sensibilities of the time. So, I put a few summary on uh, uh, this one. So basically I will say uh, in general, it's anti-tradition and uh, talking about more on the contemporary life, talk about um, usually there's no hero, okay, no God, and the protagonist usually is a, a ordinary powerless people and it's a parody. And usually it's a, a, a comic uh, parody and they have the uh, satire. So basics that's, uh, I think that's something like this that will be fit to both Gogo and uh, 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 Lu Xun's style. Okay. But technically uh, Nikolai Gogo is not being considered as a modernist uh, a writer because of time, but I think his style you know, should, should fit in this one. But, uh, and, but, but uh, since this uh, Google's writing is important for today's reading, so I would like to introduce him uh, in case you don't know him. Okay. Uh, uh, so Google was a Ukrainian born Russian writer. Right? He writes in Russia. Okay? So uh, uh, he uh, so he had been considered uh, Russian, uh, uh, his writing considers uh, Russian literature. And he's the most uh, critics as the, uh, I think the here people call him a uh, Russian, uh, Russian realist. And he has a comic realism and he would like, he'd like to, at least I didn't read many of them. I read the two of his novel. One is The Nose, one is uh, A Madman's Diary. And basically he is make fun of the petite bureaucrats. Okay, so just like in uh, uh, the a Diary of Madman, uh, the protagonist is uh, Papa Richin. Okay, he is the, low level civil service, a small officer, and then he feel like the alienation between the big society. And that's uh, Gogol's writing about uh, uh, this. So uh, he wrote the novel in 1835 and they being considered his the greatest story and they talk about minor civil servant in the time of Nicholas I. So, and important thing I, uh, I feel it like is uh, why Lu Xun learned from Gogo. Okay, uh, I will talk about Lu Xun's story. But Lu Xun went to Japan to study medicine. And the 1905, that's a Russo-Japanese uh, war. So Japan should know a lot of Russian uh, culture. So that time he probably learned, uh, read, uh, uh, Go Gogo's novel in Japan, Japanese, or in France. I don't know. He 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 also learned French. He he said he's not good in English. So, uh, so uh, this novel, uh, if you read it, you will find out there's a lot of similarity uh, between Gogo's and Lu Xun's writing. And Lu Xun has no shame or his admit he followed it. Okay and do it as a Chinese version. And I have a Russian friend 
And he told me he read that one in Russian. So that's very funny because Lushin learned from Russian, write in Chinese, and somebody in Russian translate from Chinese to Russian again. So uh, that, that would be the interesting comparison. So that's about uh, Nicholas Gogo. And then I would like to show one more slide. It's this one. You probably see that uh, many times. And the reason I show this one is you will see, OK, this one basics through the Chinese history. From, and basically, I list the Confucian scholar or Confucian philosopher, and which is the dominant philosopher. So you can see from. 25,000 years ago, Confucius, then we have the Mencius, Han Dynasty, about 100 BC, like Dong Zhongshu, start of a mystery, heaven, and the human interaction. Then you have the Zhu Xi, who is on the 13th century, we call it the Neo Confucianism, and we talk about him for, for many, many sections because he's so important and he is not. Uh, then later on, we have Wang Yangmin, we have Wang Fuzi, and last week we talk about Kang Youwei. Up to now, you know, there's no more emperor, there's a new republic, Republic of China, and Lu Xun, okay, start to this one, that's here. So the reason I show this one for a few reasons, you look at all this one, they try to improve or take a different interpretation of Confucianism. Through the history, there's nobody, at least no single person from my reading or from my knowledge, stand up and criticize and say, yes, no, you are wrong. Confucius teaching is wrong. They all just doing something to improve or go to different way. Nobody direct criticize. And the Duxin probably the first one, and then I'm, we don't have to say Lu Xun is right, but at least it's wrong for 2,000 years, nobody criticized something. It's more like in uh, Middle Age uh, or in the scholastic writing, they all try to prove God existed. Nobody tried to prove there's no God. Okay. So I think that's what a similar, similar way in this way. And another thing, you look at this chart, the first thing you see is you can say, well, that's a great tradition. We have 2,500 years tradition and that's great. But in another way, you can feel what kind of burden you carry. So uh, the more you continue, the more the heavier of the burden you have. So I think that's the situation Lu uh, Xun uh, faced. So I will stop for a while here, okay, before I go to the next part. And if you have any question or any concern or anything you want to share. Uh, Mark, please. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jason. Okay, so I've missed a lot of sessions here, so my question is maybe a little ignorant, but um. When you say that like for 2,500 years, nobody criticized Confucius, what about like the Taoists? Like what about the Zhuangzi? Is that uh, before the period you're talking about or? Good, yeah. Uh, so, uh, sorry, I have to take my words back. Okay, in Zhuangzi's writing, okay. Early Zhuangzi's writing. Okay, he make fun of Confucius. Okay, uh, thank you, Mark. To to, to remind me that this, and then uh, uh, next month, okay, when we start to run, run, yeah, they have a lot of fun meeting, and Zhuangzi is very humorous, and he, he, he criticized Confucius. Yes, thank you, Mark, you are right. But after that time, all right, and nobody doing that, even the near Taoists, they try to prove Confucius is also the Taoist sage. And then uh, Lao Tzu, even the Taoist sage, he also same as uh, Confucius. So that's a near Taoism. So uh, thank you, Mark. Yeah, I, I forget. Uh, Zhuang Zi is the one who constantly, constantly make fun of Confucius. Uh, James, please. Okay, yeah, that's okay, thank you. So like about after what year would you say that Confucian was above criticism? Oh, I'm sorry. 
Uh, Mark, uh, can, you, can you repeat your question? Yeah, after what year would you say Confucius became above criticism? Like roughly like it, what Oh, year? I think it's about 100 BC. Okay. That's the Han okay. Dynasty. Thank you. Okay, during that time, because Dong Zhong Su started to make Confucius as the uh, orthodoxy uh, 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 school. Okay. And uh, since then, nobody criticizes. Oh, of course, you know, in the Cultural Revolution, uh, then uh, China <laughs> has no problem to criticize Confucius. And that's why, and I will talk about this one day, uh, a little bit later about the virtue and the Taiwan and Chiang Kai-shek right, got to go to different way. He has to promote Confucianism as much as he can. Uh, I, I think James, you have a question. Right? You have hands up before. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I was just interested in how this. Uh, uh, I'll be very interested in how this relates to the 1911 revolution, and uh, you know, uh, the I, I wasn't very completely aware of the uh, the 1911 revolution, and uh, so I was just hoping that uh, uh, this this will come up in the discussion. Uh, how how this relates to um, Lujan's um, participation in the 1911 revolution and the power of that, uh, the power of that uh, reconstitution of society vis-a-vis uh, -vis modernism. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, James. And I will, I will talk a little bit, but not too much. I probably will put another section to talk about this uh, revolution. Uh, uh, of course, I will focus more on the philosophy, cultural part, and then uh, somebody uh, builds, uh, and the political is a complicated case, and I will try my best. Yeah, yeah thank you, Jim. And Phil, please. Yeah, well, thank you for showing that timeline. What occurs to me is that uh, after 2,500 2, years of a tradition, uh, it, it must have consolidated uh, not only external power, but a kind of internal power, in a sense. Uh, and I know Lu Xun was uh, influenced by modernism and, you know, out of Japan, and particularly in the change, uh, the condition that modern China in the early 20th century was experiencing. But generally, you think of a, a break from the tradition as uh, somehow initiated from the outside, which which it was to a certain degree. But on the other hand, the tradition must have weighed so much on it that it had to, in a sense, approach it from the breakout from the inside. So it has to somehow, in a sense, take account of Confucianism and break out of it rather than just an external kind of breaking down. So, so you can't break out of the wall. You, you can't, it's not a kind of thing that broke out of the wall from the outside, but kind of break in from the inside that pushes out. So. That seems like a very important uh, factor. Thank you. Well, right. oh, thank you, thank you. Okay. Uh, so, any other comment? Okay, let's move on to the uh, uh, another uh, uh, second part. Let's talk about this person, Du Xu. Okay. So, just a brief introduction about this uh, him. Uh, uh, I don't want to go to all the detail because today you can go to uh, uh, internet. If you are interested, you can find a lot of information. So I think I just want to point out some interesting and uh, again, during his time, the just like Jim asked about the 911, uh, 1911 revolution. Okay, so happened during this time, right? So a lot of historical, the war, uh, the box, the Bax Rebellion and the, the Opinion War, Sino, uh, 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 Sino uh, Japanese War, okay, uh, uh, Russo Japanese War, uh, World War I, and it, many, many things happened. So, if you want to talk about history during this time, in his lifetime, probably more things happened than past 2000 years. So, uh, it, so constantly we will mention it, but you know we cannot complete. Okay. So he was born in the place is important, San uh, Zhao Xin in the Zhejiang province, okay, which is two hundred km from uh, Shanghai. Okay, and remember 
Last week, when we talk about the philosopher uh, Tang Youwei, Liang Qichao, they all from Guangdong, which is not far away from Hong Kong. Okay. And uh, today, we talk about the people. Uh, uh, he's from uh, Shaoxing. Shaoxing is not far away from Shanghai. And as you know, during that time, Shanghai is so-called the international settlement, so not belong to China. Same as uh, Hong Kong is belong to British Empire. So they have the foreign influence. So they got more different thinking than the people in Beijing or in the Indent. So uh, that, that's also important now. So uh, 1881, interesting is when he was 11 years old, oh, his family is a rich family, is a scholarly family. His grandpa is so-called Jin Shi, who is the in the civil, uh, the royal civil, civil exam is the highest level. You have the uh, go to for the Xiu Cai, that's the in the local level, then go to your province level, they call Ju Ren. And the highest level is the national test. You got pass, you got the Jin Shi, and the, you will get the central government job. And of course, the high position job comes with a lot of money, fortune. So his family is rich because his grandpa is a Jin Shi. So, you know, it's rich and high position. But look nice, his father, okay? uh, Lu Xun's father is not a good student, probably cannot pass the imperial examination for many times. So his grandpa has to bribe the examiner okay, to let his son, who is Lu Xun's father pass. So you will know how serious of this kind of thing. You know? Even you are in the high government officer, you cannot, you know, they have no back door for your uh, son to pass the exam. You have the back door to give your son position, but you don't have the back door to let your son pass the examination. So he has to bribe the examiner but unfortunately got caught. So the sentence is death penalty, okay? So by this, their family, you know, uh, I think the family keep bribing more. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, Lu Xun's grandpa can survive, but they will use up uh, their family fortune. So when Lu Xun was 20, oh, again, okay, during the, all this time, Lu Xun, of course, he was trained as a Chinese, uh, Confucian uh, uh, a student in order to continue the imperial examination. So when you are 20, okay, uh, 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 the, the Qing dynasty decide to abolish the imperial examination, which has been wrong for 1300 years. Okay. So what kind of uh, uh, situation you, you try to bribe and be in the sentence to death and then turn out no more exam. Okay, so what kind of dramatic you know, change during his time? So uh, then he went to Japan to study and he wanted to study uh, medicine. At that time, a lot of uh, uh, people study medicine because they, they, the, the, the most obvious advice you can see from the Western culture is the medicine because so many diseases they can cure, so many things they can do, which Chinese medicine cannot do. So the, almost, I would not say almost, a lot of people I know, uh, I mean, the person in my age, their grandparents okay, from China, when they go abroad to study, they study medicine, most of them. But he didn't practice because he's more interested in uh, culture, in philosophy, so he's a, uh, medical doctor, but never practiced. So when he was 27 years old, he went back to China. And then, so after, so after 19, after uh, the uh, 1911 uh, revolution, so 1912 is application of the Qin Empire. So that's the first year of the Republic of China. And as most of people may know, the government, 
actually it still survived officially in Taiwan. Okay, now that's another interesting part. Okay, we are not going to talk about this, but the Republic of China uh, is. <laughs> Uh, 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 Taiwan still keep this name, but you know, that's a different story. But the uh, Republic of China is a very weak government. Dr. Sun Yixian uh, from this government and uh, uh, actually it's more war after this one. So important thing is the, uh, from, uh, I think from uh, 1911 to 1920, that's the so-called the new cultural movement. Okay. So basics uh in when Lu Xun was 33 years old, he and he and uh, Chen Du Xiu, Hu Shi, Lu Xun, and the other scholars, uh, they all have a foreign uh study like Lu uh Hu Shi, we talked about a few times. He was a uh, Jiang Dui student and studied in uh, I think it's in Colombia, and then he went back to China. So they all join together and they have the magazine called New Youth Magazine. And that's 10 years, so-called the cultural movement, the new cultural movement. And one thing important, all these people, not including Feng Yolan, the person I follow, because he also Jiang Du is still do that. I don't know if he went back to China or not, but he's not in this movement because he is more traditional. He still consider himself as a Confucianism. Okay. So, and when he was 36 years old, Lu Xun write the first Chinese vernacular novel, okay, the Madman's Diary. Okay. So, uh, Phil, you have something to say? Yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I saw a, a, a program uh, on him. Uh, Fairly short program, and it seems important to stress about the fall of his family because he he started out uh, sort of at least in a, a lower middle lower upper class. So, and then it fell all the way to where he was really impoverished. I mean, his whole family broke up, and I think in that in that fall. He was able to experience uh, the pathos of the uh, of the dispossessed, and that was very very important because he now know the contrast between the the elite uh, uh, lifestyle and the pathos of the uh, uh, dispossessed, and I think that was an important part of his criticism of uh, eventually, I suppose you could say, fighting for. Uh, the dispossessed in a way, you know, because he experienced it. He he had direct kind of existential experience of that uh, as well. And so that was supplemented, of course, by his study abroad, you know, and uh, they brought up uh, the fact that he actually studied Nietzsche, which is kind of interesting. Oh, okay. That's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, th thank you. And I think in the novel, you know, there's one, Hard, you can tell, you know, definitely just like what do you talk about this kind of experience. He talk about lion and the rabbit. He was lion before, and then uh, as a predator. Okay, if you never your family never fall, you always stay on the predator. Okay, as a lion, so you never know they have a, <laughs> a, a rabbit here. Uh, James. Are you still going to speak about the um, the uh, couplet at the bottom of the page? Yeah, I'm going to talk about okay. this. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I like this one, the last couplet. Okay, so that's he probably do it. Talk about himself. Okay, so uh, I make this translation and the Mei Chen Fu Fu Wei Ru Zi Niu. I think that's pretty uh, admirable. Okay. So he talked about his attitude is to sourly pointing fingers I defied with fierce brows. To young children, I will bow and serve as a cow. Okay. So when we read the novel, pay attention on the children. He talked about children. Okay. And he, the last sentence he talked about, save the children. Okay. So that's his purpose, to join the new cultural movement. That's the purpose. He strongly criticized Confucian uh, 
philosophy. So I think that's it. Thank you, uh, uh, James, to mention this. Cow is a symbol of uh, nourishment of children. Yeah. So new cultural movement. Okay. So that's doing after the, uh, actually it happened before, already before the uh, 1911 revolution. Okay. They already have the new cultural movement. So in a way you can say the new cultural movement helped uh, 1911 revolution. So personally, I like this period of time because of, that, of course, that's because of my personality, I would like to criticize, see more criticism, okay, than uh, 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 support. So uh, this movement uh, from 1910 to 1920, and actually the end with the so-called main force movement, and I, I personally, I don't like main force movement because it changed the direction from cultural, the revised the culture to patriotic movement. And of course, Ch Ch Chinese government will appreciate this movement. So uh, the, I think up to, I think today is still the same. Uh, the China, in China, the U state is main force. So uh, 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 of course they have a, cultural component out there, but I think main force is being turned to uh, more uh, political and become a patriotic movement. So I will talk about uh, a new cultural movement and this one. And if you see this one um, on the picture, so-called Xin Qingnian, okay? And then he wrote the, the, the he didn't write the new use, he wrote the, the in French. That you know, I don't know how to pronounce, but basically, the at that time, like Chen Du Xiu and a lot of communist uh, uh, so called scholar, okay, they are from France, okay, and you probably know during that time that's the uh, also a communist movement in uh, uh, France in Paris, and the Deng Xiaoping is the time you know during that time. So, the new cultural movement, okay, so again. It's talking about progressive modern ideas and election, you know, actually uh, all this kind of concept. So at that time, they talk about two major things. One is uh, democracy, or you want to talk about uh, election, or sometimes it's about the uh, egalitarianism, right? Uh, egalitarianism. Right, talk about equal and then talk about progress, progressiveness. Right? So that's the idea they are talking about. And I like to summarize here. <clears throat> so important concept they want to do is first they want to promote, that's a start to do it, the vernacular literature, okay, which is the uh, Lu Xun's writing. And that's the example of vernacular literature. I, I will have the next slide to talk about uh, vernacular. And then uh, they want to end the uh, patriarch patriarchal uh, family and in favor of individual freedom and women's liberalization, okay? And they view China as a nation among other nations. Okay, remember, if we read the ancient text, whenever they said under the heaven, okay, I all translate to the world. So during ancient time, I think up to this moment, okay, people still think China is the one, okay, so under the heaven, that's the world, that's China. So they want to tell people, they want to say, we come on, recognize China just one of many, many, many nations. It's no uniqueness, okay? And then, so they want to re-examination of a Confucian text, okay? So they want to start to criticize, be more uh, critical on all ancient texts, okay? So um, another thing is uh, uh, democratic and egalitarian value. They start to bring up this one. And then they want to move toward to the future. And if you read the Confucius or ancient Chinese teaching, usually you look at the back, 
whenever you talk about the ancient time, that means a good time. Okay, the sage is the ancient time. Okay, so that's the big problem. Okay, and Hu Si also write a, lot, a few things on that. So uh, we will introduce uh, when we had the chance. Uh, Phil, please. Yeah, I have a question about this, uh, and, and, and it's kind of like maybe I don't think it's off topic, but it might be. Okay. I mean, I. I've always been a kind of an admirer of Chiu Enlai because he seemed like the only sane one in the Communist Party. <laughs> and uh, to, to, I think that he made some effort to, in a sense, mediate between these groups, but he wasn't successful. And I wonder to what degree that made him different. Was it because he was uh, still a Neo-Confucius, Confucian uh, scholar, or was it because he went to France instead of Japan? And therefore was tied up with the communists, and because it seems to me things would have been very, very different if he had, uh, in a sense, uh, sided with, you know, this other aspect rather than being a kind of a nationalist. Yeah, so, uh, say uh, something uh, about that. It just seems interesting. Yeah, I know it's interesting, but I probably will put a stop here because it okay. will become an endless discussion about Zhou and Then you will talk about Mao Zedong. Then you will talk about. Jiang Kai Shek, and then we become the <laughs> endless discussion. On it. I know. Sorry. Your concern is very valid and it's very interesting. And when we have a drink, and we can talk about this for like two hours. <laughs> so thank you, Phil, anyway. Uh, so here I like to I make this one uh, because from time to time I find out some people got confused about these uh, terms about written Chinese. We all know the Chinese has a different dialect. But the different thing is, so many people use Chinese uh, character to be them, okay? And the people around the world, in America, in Malaysia, Singapore, you know, all over the place, they probably they speak different and different, and, and, but the written form for 2000 years are never changed. So you have a hard time to talk to people in, in, uh, in, 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 in people speak different, uh, uh, dialect, but you have no problem when you put in the writing. So that's the part, you know, keep. And this one also, that's one in one way it's advantage, okay, because uh, people can communicate with writing. But the, but that means the written, the written format and would be apart from your spoken format. You speak, you don't write what you speak. If you write what you speak, if you talk about different dialect, then they would be, you know, difficult to understand. So for example, uh, 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 before when I was young, uh, uh, Hong Kong is this, um, uh, Chinese culture, so they all, when they write Chinese, they write in their Cantonese uh, dialect. So sometimes they have time to read, you know, their writing, okay? So uh, this kind of situation. So, so that's why we, at that time they start to move. So we call it classical Chinese and the vernacular Chinese. So vernacular, vernacular Chinese is the way of writing. You write what you speak. Okay. And the classical Chinese is different way of writing. So at that time, in 1920, during that time, Hu Si is the most uh, supporter to change the way of writing. And of course, there's a lot of objection on that. Remember last week when we talk about Yan Fu, he's a translator. He translates the uh, J.S. Uh, James Mills and uh, the uh, Spencer's writing to Chinese, but he doesn't translate it to vernacular Chinese. He had to change to classical Chinese because if you write this vernacular Chinese, the people will say, ah, that's not serious writing. You have to write in classical Chinese. So when we read Dao De Jing, read Sun Zi, the Art of War, when we read uh, uh, Confucius analog, they all in classical Chinese. And from time to time, people confuse with, oh, does Taiwan use classical uh, 
uh, uh, uh, China uses vernacular. No, no, that's a different thing. When we talk about simple by character and the classical character, that's the one talking about. Because 1950, around 1950, Chinese tried to simplify the writing because you can see the words are so difficult to write. So uh, Chinese government have to simplify it. So personally, I like it because it, it's much easier to write when I write it. But up to this year, these few years, I don't use uh, simplified Chinese anymore because I don't write. I use computer when you type and it doesn't matter if it's simplified or not simplified. So in my opinion, the, the traditional Chinese character is easy to read and the simplified Chinese character is easy to write. And since the writing is done by computer, so I don't see I have to use uh, simplified Chinese anymore. So that, that's my plan. So I give an example here. This one means international business news report, right? So you will see compare the top one is the complex and each word will be different. I think what I will say 50% of the word, okay, would be some are the same. So it become much easier to write. If you want to, you learn to write and learn the simplified, much easier because uh, if you ask me to handwrite, I, I, I don't really have a hard time to write the, uh, the, the traditional one. So by doing this, the vernacular language, vernacular Chinese and classical Chinese has nothing to do with the simplified versus the traditional. Right. So on the very first chapter of very first book of Confucius and right called the Confucius said, uh, which means uh, if you learn the knowledge and you can have a chance to practice, is that a happy thing? Okay. So you write, you can write in uh a uh, traditional character or write in the simplified character, you can compare the difference. But they all in classical Chinese. And I don't believe Confucius during that time speak in this way. I believe Confucius must speak in the vernacular way, not the, the this kind of written form, because I just don't think it's possible to speak this way. So if you translate to vernacular, it becomes much longer, okay. So I just traced it, okay. Uh, so you can see uh, lots of the different, okay, of the different things. I hope I make it clear, and I believe a lot of people probably already know the difference, but I know uh, from time to time people have some uh, misunderstanding about this. Uh, Madeline, uh, thank you for waiting. Yes, thanks, Jason. This is so interesting so far. Um, yeah. My question is uh, actually about the use of language uh, in the text we're going to discuss, mm -hmm. uh, because quite frankly, I would not have known that this was political in any way had I not known before I read it. And so what I thought was perhaps there were uh, words in there that were homophones, sound alike mm -hmm. words, um, that to a native Chinese speaker like maybe the word for cannibalism sounds like the word for filial piety, or I'm just making something up, but that there would be some um, uh, verbal pun in there that was an indicator to people that this was a text about Confucianism, because there was really nothing in there uh, that that indicated that. I, I, I don't think it's political at all, you know, that's my opinion. I, I, at least I don't, unless other people have different, uh, at least I don't see uh, there's any political uh, reason. Okay, um, well, philosophical then. Um, I wouldn't have known that it was had anything to do with Confucianism. No, I, I don't think there's none, nothing to do with Confucianism. I, I don't okay. think, okay, no, nothing with Confucianism. It's just, well, of course, when China make the a simplified uh, character. It's during the movement of anti-Confucianism movement, the Cultural Revolution. So they even make the second step to even more simplified. 
and even try to use the Roman uh, alphabet to spell Chinese. Okay, that's how radical they try to do, but they fail because it, it, it's just difficult without, because the Chinese still a visual, uh, I, that, that's my theory, but I, I, I know not everybody agree. I think reading Chinese is difficult than reading English or any other Western language, because uh, in English, you read, right? You, you read, it's a sound, so it's directly here, so you know. But Chinese will be different. You see the character that's a thing, then you have to convert to sound, and then do it. So basics, uh, <laughs> I have to use double the energy to read Chinese than read English. And right now my English get better and better. I start to realize probably that's true. So I find out I read English faster than uh, reading Chinese, even that's a ma my mother tongue. So I I'm not sure, that's just my personal <laughs> uh, experience. So uh, uh, James, please. Yeah, I'm uh, fascinated by the uh, length of the text in the vernacular version of uh, the Confucius quote. Uh, that uh, I take it that's what you said. The first, the classical Chinese is the first one, and then the last, the the second one, is the vernacular version, yeah, not a vernacular the second, version. This part is yeah, I, yeah. I was wondering if you could transliterate that carefully uh, for us in English, so that we understood how, what, where this complexity, this the, visual complexity lies. Okay, so basics. I will say okay. The vernacular Chinese is much closer to English. All right, let's put it this way. So basically I can easily translate this sentence because it said, after learning the knowledge, okay, and I have a chance to, in the right time to practice my knowledge. Is that happy? Okay, yeah. in classical Chinese, they, I think the problem is this. I, the problem is uh, there is a few problems on the classical Chinese. First, the lack of the logical conjunction. So it's, you have the because, therefore, but it's very rough, okay? So you, know, you lack of this, okay? If you lack of this, then you, that's when I do the translation, I face the hard time because I have to figure out what's the logical behind, all right? It's, and second thing, Chinese is different because one character have different meaning. And of course you will say uh, English yeah, the same way. When you say park, it could be the park in the outside. It could be parking your car. Yeah, but Chinese is more complex than that. And the Chinese never have the, the, the words never change, just like our spelling for different uh, uh, tense, okay. Uh, is a different and the word for verb, adjective, adjective, uh, adjective, uh, adjective, uh, adjective or verb or noun, they are different. But Chinese never change. And uh, one word, it can be verb, it could be noun, it could be you know adjective. So you know it could be anything. So you have to guess. So the meaning is not clear. That's why the vernacular become more precise because uh, because the the, you can use two or three words to describe the one word so it become more accurate. And you can easily adopt the new concept because you have the new thing happen, they have a foreign thing coming, foreign concept, I want to form a new concept, they will be easier to do it. Okay. And another problem of classical Chinese is the entry barrier is very high. You have to read a lot, a lot, a lot of things. Then you start to understand how to read, how to write. So not everybody can do it. Okay. I think that's why you know the literacy rate is very low because it's it's hard. It's hard to read, okay, and hard to write. So you can keep you know the structure, the uh, hierarchy there, I think some people will be happy to keep the one. So when Hu Si, they have this vernacular language movement, a lot of objection on that. The people say, come on, that's a stupid. How can I use the same language as the, you know, the beggar, okay? The, 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 the toilet cleaner, 
uh, no, no, we are scholars. So, you know, with the labor worker, no, 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 we don't speak the same language and whatever I write, he can read. That's stupid, you know. So people have this kind of concept here. So we will move on for Fred and uh, Carly. Fred, please. Uh, yeah, Jason, I know that it's difficult for a uh, <clears throat> for you as a host to see the comment section, but yeah. uh, Madeline uh, clarified what I thought was her excellent question in the comments by uh, pointing out that her question uh, related to the text of the short story, Diary of a Madman, rather than Oh, okay. itself. So that I, I think to rephrase the question, um, are we missing something in reading the translation that would be more apparent? Uh, because as you point in, in the in the Chinese, because as you point out, the Chinese characters can refer to can have multiple meanings, and perhaps we're missing some meaning in the translation because it's not immediately apparent to me and to others that the Diary of a Madman short story has any uh, connotation of Confucianism or philosophy. Okay, so I, okay, I don't see, so I don't see Okay, I think that's here's the two questions here, right? One is about let, 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 let's talk about pure vernacular and uh, classical language. I don't see the vernacular language or there's some part missing. Yes, it, when you translate, it always there's some part missing. I have to admit, yeah, I I, I think that's right whenever you translate either from Chinese to English or from classical Chinese to vernacular Chinese, they always have some part missing. And the more important, they always have, cannot be one-to-one -one match because a lot of things you have to reinterpret. So that's the first, I answer the first question. And second thing is about the, the, the novel. Um, Yes, they have the some part when you read in English, uh, it's not there. That's why I want to have uh, a little bit close read uh, on the novel. So we have about one hour. I think that's, that's enough uh, for us to dissect this, uh, 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 this novel. And since it's written in vernacular Chinese, so the English is, translated to English is much easier. Unlike when we read Art of War or read uh, Analex or Tao Te Ching, they have much more difficult to do it. So I, I, I also this in my presentation, also this some of the Chinese. So you will see some of the difference uh, we lost in when we translate from Chinese to English. Uh, Kari, please. Yeah, thanks, Jason. That elucidates a lot. I think um, you answered most of my questions, but back to Madeline's question, maybe about the diary of a madman. I also would not have known that it was um, oh, tongue in cheek or a criticism or um, I lost my other words, a parody maybe. Yeah. Of that culture, had you not told us last week. And I guess our question is, how is it that you discern that it was? Is that based on the text, the vernacular, or the, you had mentioned earlier that the classical Chinese is easier for you to read and the vernacular is more complex and I understand it incorporates more too, but is there something about the text that we're going to go over that gives you that impression, maybe with homophones or synonyms or uh, is it just a style of writing or is it based on the history of the man that we've gone over? Uh, I will say all of this and also including uh, Lu Xun himself, the author himself also talk about this. Uh, I think it will be similar when we read uh, Gogol's writing, okay, about the Madman man, 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 Diary. He really just talk about Madman. 
how do we know he is talking about the social uh, at the end, uh, at the uh, uh, okay? When you read uh, Gogol's uh, novel, The Nose, right? What he talking about, a nose become a person and then even have a high ranking than the person, than him. So why he talking about this, right? He talk about the society, the bureaucratic society. Of course, as a reader, you can just read as a joke and then have fun, that, that'll be fine. So uh, I, I read it in this way and I, Lu Xun also tell us to read it in this way. Okay, that's the uh, solid evidence. And uh, during that period of time, and I was not surprised, you know, he talked about Confucianism. Okay, or you talk about the Chinese society in total. Great, thanks. I think I'm with you then. So uh, let's move on. Uh, then, oh, I have one more chapter. Uh, uh, Joe is here. That's great. <laughs> Just, nice to see you, Jason. Yeah, Joe asked uh, virtual, so I want. I, I know you are interested in virtual, so okay, let me this one slide to make for you. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so I think last week you asked me about the cardinal virtues in Chinese. Okay, so I'm going to give you answer now, and which is related to this one. So we all know the Greek virtue. Okay, they have the four cardinal virtues: prudence, or sometimes you want to trace the wisdom, uh, justice, temperance, courage. Right. And later on, they have the Christian, during the Christian time, they add three more, right? Become the charity, or one called love, hope, and the faith. So that's the virtue, cardinal virtue in the Western world. Chinese, okay. Traditionally, zhong xiao ren yi, loyalty, filial piety, humanity, or you want to uh, benevolence, ren, and the righteousness is the major. I think it's, it, there's no, no such thing as four major uh, virtue in Chinese, but basically if you want ask most of people to this four most important, I think this four would be important. So around the new cultural movement and then uh, the, the, the establish of the new government, the uh, Republic of China, uh, Dr. Sun Yixian, okay. Uh, Sun Yixian is another person who study medicine, never practice, okay. become a revolutionary. And uh, the, he also not only uh, build a new government, he also want to change the virtue. So he kind of revised. <clears throat> so become a so-called eight virtue and put in the four pairs. So called Zhong Xiao, they put the Zhong and the Xiao together, and the Ren, okay, humanity add another I, okay, which is love, humanity and the love. Remember, he is a Christian, okay, that's why he put this one, okay, Ren I, okay. Then you have the Yi righteousness, and he believe Chinese also need to be more, the world should be more trustworthy, okay, more on the uh, Western world, more. Uh, contract base, okay, so when you sign it, you have to honor your word. So he put the trustworthiness and the righteousness. And the last one, he put the harmony and the peace. So Zhong Xiao, Ren Ai, Xin Yi, He Ping, become a new virtue called eight virtue, Chinese called Ba De. The reason I'm talking about this, one is related to today's uh, subject, another one is in case, you visit Taipei in Taiwan, okay, and you decide to drive, and then you use Google Map to guide you, okay. You are familiar with this word. I believe that's probably the only place in the world that still use virtual as your the name of road. So when you drive and using Google um, Map, it will tell you. Go north on the Ba De Road, turn right on the Zhong Xiao Road, okay, and then turn left on the Xin Yi Road. Okay, so they all this virtue. And I think the, the that's a historical uh legend, historical leftover from Jiang Kai Shek, because he he liked to educate Taiwanese people. So he put all these virtues in the major road in Taipei. So you still can see it and but uh, 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 if you want to revise. 
what's all this virtual. And I put this one, but I'm not going to talk about this one today and we will change it next time. That's a very famous about the, uh, I think they kind of talking about 24 video examples. Okay, they have the 24 and most of them, uh, I would say stupid nonsense and then, but it's in the history. So uh, 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 we have a chance we can talk about this one. So before we read the novel, okay, they have a 13 chapter. Okay, so uh, any question, comment? And if you have read, you have something, and it's anybody, and you know, we can share at the end. Yeah. So ready? Let's go through the okay. Mark, please. Yeah. Before before we get away from the diary, the matter. Um, so I actually feel lucky that I didn't hear the instructions because I read the novel having no understanding that it had any social critique value. So I just read it as if it was supposed to be the diary of Madden. There was no other implication to it. And so it, 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 I had a whole bunch of questions about like how common was cannibalism in China at that time? Like how far-fetched was his idea that his neighbors might want to eat him? You know, like his brother said, well, cannibalism doesn't make sense unless there's famine. And I've heard that, that cannibalism was actually uh, fairly common in Guangxi province during the Great Leap Forward when there was a lot of famine. So it, it brought up all these questions for me about like how realistic was this guy's fear of uh, him, how crazy uh, he was. So that was mostly what I was thinking uh, about. But, but I haven't, so I'd like to hear your comment on that. But also I have another question, which is that um, uh, what is in, in Lucian's um, writing, how is he relating Confucianism to cannibalism? Like clearly, I mean, he's, he see, at least my understanding is he sees both of them as bad, but more concretely, what is the similarity that he sees between Confucianism and cannibalism? So those are the two things I'd, I'd like you to comment on. Thank you. Okay, so I hope you go through and then, well, I'm, I'm not going to uh, uh, ask everybody to agree with me because some people hate him a lot. You know, so you know, and there's no reason to uh, everybody agree on his uh, assessment. Uh, let's go through the novel and then because it's very short and then uh, we will have a chance to discuss uh, this question. Of course, everybody will have this question. And remember this book, Lu Xin's writing is banned when I was in Taiwan, when I was a student uh, because it's anti-Confucianism. And that's another evidence, you know, uh, he's anti-Confucianism because he's banned, okay, in Chiang Kai-shek's government. So since he's banned, so become my must read uh, novel. So I find underground and find it and I read it. Okay, so, uh, uh, so, so that's the talking about. Different thing is when he started, even I call it, the, people call it the vernacular novel. When you started, he started, he has a prologue. And his prologue is writing in classical Chinese. I just this here. And this is the day, okay, 1918, uh, April 2nd. Okay, I don't know why he chose April 2nd. Okay, the second day after uh, April 4th, I'm not sure. And the day he said, you know, he found this diary from a person. He hid his the name and then uh, he, 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 this, this one for medical, for the purpose is for medical, subject of medical research. And he believed this guy, the madman, has a persecution mania. Okay, this kind of disease. So he's a doctor. So he said, oh, I'm a doctor. I find this one and I, I hide the person's name and hide the person's location and then keep this record. So become a medical record so the doctor can research. That's his prologue. And he totally written in the classical Chinese. And then after that, he start to show 13 chapters on that, which he removed, he said, he removed the date. Unlike Gogol's writing, Gogol keep the date. If you read Gogol, he starts from, October something and it goes through all crazy to you know, year 3000, something like this. So, but this one has no, uh, 
no date. So it has a 13th chapter and it is very short. Okay. Chapter one. Okay. So tonight very bright, just writing. And I just this is something I think that's meaningful um, uh, each chapter. So first the ending, he talked about, uh, he see the dog, okay? Just pay attention on the dog. He said the dog also look at Zhao house, okay? The Zhao, the, the, the Zhao, Zhao family is a permanent family in that village. So that the dog look at him, you know, in a different way. So he feel, he has a fear and he say, he believe he must have the reason to fear, okay? But he would not tell you. And the words that he used is the, okay? So which associates to the Confucius, uh, neo Confucius talking about the, okay? So he's talking about this kind of thing he feel, okay? So that's the chapter one, okay? So then he still to looking around and then he find out the talk, in the chapter one, the dog look at him, okay, kind of like have an evil kind of eye to look at him. And then here, he also noticed a group of children in front also discussing me, talk about him. Okay. And then their eye, look in their eye, just like Mr. Zhao. So Mr. Zhao, his dog and all the children look him, okay, this is changing, okay. And he tried to think bad of what he did wrong, you know. He think he can do something wrong. He tried on Mr. Gu Chu's account sheet, okay, the accounting book. So uh, Gu Chu, uh, Gu Jiu, okay, Gu Jiu means very old accounting book. So he's talking about, he probably uh, uh, reject the ancient tradition, Gu Jiu, okay, Mr. Gu Jiu, okay, that in the same name as uh, very old. So he's talking about this, he reject this one. Uh, um, and uh, so, and he start wondering why the children, this one, then his final is, I know, they must have learned this from their parents. So at least the Chinese, he said, he didn't use the real words, the parent, he used the very slang, like niang lang, it means uh, old man, okay, old, old woman, okay, so it's a very local slang, disrespectful. So he kind of talking about must be learned from their parents. Uh, James, please. Yeah, I, I, just, I, I haven't gotten very far into the Google yet, but uh, this is like, uh, uh, very cute how this uh, now I'm realizing that this just reflects the uh, the Google uh, mm -hmm. and it's like comedic it's comedic the uh, uh, Mr. Kuchu uh, account sheets that's the, uh, the the person who he realizes is his natural enemy is the accountant the corporation accountant uh, he can't get a raise oh. because of the accountant is so narrow minded and the um, and the children, uh, the, those are the, uh, in the Gogol, those are two dogs, which he realizes are actually speaking English to the, each other. And he even Washington. says, uh, one of them even says that uh, uh, you, you should have gotten my letter by now. I wrote you a letter, you should have received it. So uh, it's like uh, the absurdity of, uh, of uh, the, uh, the, the dog uh, looking at him twice. So that's the reference to the yeah, uh, I think that's talking a dog. We also yeah. talk about talk and then yeah. also talk about church. Okay. So, uh, so it's parody, about, parody inside of uh, imitation. Yeah. Yeah. They have the imitation and they have the different purpose. And then their imitation are the same, their style are the same. Okay. I think that's a very good, uh, I would not call parody, I call it a very good um, um, imitation. And the, in some sense, he probably do it better. Well, of course, I don't know Russian, so I, it's hard to say, but you know, he did a very good job, uh, in my opinion, yeah, as a limitation. So move on, chapter three. Uh, uh, here, he talk, he start to, let me see. Chapter three, a little bit longer. Okay, so here he described, okay, the situation. He kind of think about these people, the village people, okay, and the regular people, 
they probably been pilloried by the magistrate. They been slapped in the face by the local gentry. Has their wife been taken away by babies? They just take advantage because they're a criminal. Their parent driven to suicide by commit suicide by creditor. So look at this one. The criminal has been treated, you know, being pilloried. Uh, the local gentry can slap people in the face. And if you are in jail, your wife will be in, people will take advantage of your wife if you borrow money. So he is describing the society during that time. Okay. And he starts to feel, you know. And the, at least along this one, because they saw green face, long tooth, basically is talking about the in the hell. Okay. Uh, the, the, the monster is looking like this. And then he continued, he talk about, he start to wonder. They think these kind of people, they probably they eat human beings. Okay. So they, they must eat me. They may eat me. Okay. So he start, that's why he start to feel, has a feel on that. So here he talk about, even I'm not a bad man, ever since I trod on Mr. Gu, Gu Chiu's account. So he believed he didn't do, he's not a bad people, okay? But, you know, since after he trod Mr. Gu Chiu's account, and then, then he been treated in this way. And he started to think bad when he, he has an elder brother taught him how to write composition. That's the training to pass the civil exam, the, the royal civil exam. So all about Confucius reading. So how can I possibly guess the secret stopped? Okay, especially when they are ready to eat people. So he started to thinking about these people is man eater. And then he started to reflect what he learned in the Confucius teaching. The teaching is full of virtue and the morality. If you read Analect, okay, I, I, I think I did a word count. There's only 10,000 characters. There's a hundred words about Ren, okay, humanity. And if you count all the virtual words, the full of virtual words. So between the world, he find out, he got scaled. He find out between the world, he said, eat people. Okay. That's his theory. Okay. So he is a man. So he believed they okay, want to eat him. That's why he's scaled. Then he move on to chapter four, okay. Chapter four, he start to talking about the doctor, Mr. Ho, Mr. Ho, right? Okay. So, uh, he, okay. So his brother bring the doctor, okay, to Mr. Ho to examine him because he's sick. He's a neurosis, okay, the protagonist. So here, how he feel about this doctor? He talked about, all right, he talked to the doctor. Actually, I was quite well that, okay, well known, okay, that this old man was ex executioner in disguise. He simply used the pretext of feeling of my pulse to see how fat I was because he started to believe, okay, he has a prosecution mania. Okay, so he started to feel okay, as a madman, man, he started to feel this doctor actually is executioner in disguise, a doctor. And to check, does he has enough meat? When you say how fat you can eat, usually like a pig, right? Get fatter than you can eat. So just check. So here he is talking about the Confucian teacher. Okay. Oh, the, this teacher are not teaching you not cure you, not help you. Basically, they are examine you. In the whole society, the teacher, instead of helping you, teach you, guide you, okay, the teacher basically is exempt you. See, you're good, or not good. That's his theory. So they start to, he start to cry, like 
the eater of human flesh is my elder brother. He start to realize his brother also a man eater. So I'm the younger brother of an eater, a cannibal. And I myself eaten by others, but nonetheless, I'm the youngest brother of the man eat, uh, of the cannibals. So basics that he is talking about. Then move on chapter five, okay. <clears throat> he start to find the evidence from the history book. So he start to suspect Chinese culture could be the main eating culture, could be the main uh, cannibal uh, culture. So he started to look at the book. So he mentioned a few people, the, uh, because the doctor checked him, right? The Chinese doctor. And then uh, another person called Li Shizhen, right? Li Shizhen, right? The Chinese herb. He has a book called the Ben Chao Gang Mu, right? That's the kind of the in encyclopedia of all the Chinese herb. He's the person who uh, compiled all this on the 16th day, 16th century, being considered as a predecessor of the Chinese uh, doctor. Uh, in this book, he checked this book, okay, they also record the human flesh, okay, can be cure some disease, okay. So here I have to defend for uh, this season a little bit, okay. Uh, I think that that's what well, defense also uh, criticized. I, I, I realized through the history, Chinese culture lack of uh, something called Verification, usually people just take the account and if it's old, people respect it. Hardly to I say, okay, let's check whether or not it's true or not true. I think that's the attitude for most of the Chinese during the history. So the Shizhen, he did a great job. He collect all the information about the herb and the kid, but he never verified because probably the verification is not a concept. So here he keep the record and not only one, there's many, many press uh, talk about different part of human flesh can cure different part of the. So this madman, he look at the book and find out what, that's right. And then the, even the medical book talk about eating human. So, and then also in the history book, and that's true, okay? I also read it, talk about yi zi er shi. They say, uh, uh, what do they say? Exchange sounds to eat, okay? So whenever in the history, uh, we, uh, because through 2000 years, many forbids happened. When people are hungry and the, the historian will write, people are hungry, how many people die? They exchange some to eat. Okay. I don't know if it's a metaphorical or a rhetorical, okay, but definitely have some truths. Probably not all truths, but definitely there's something happened. So he find in the historical account, they have many descriptions about exchange some to eat. And they have a Chinese saying, okay. He talk about uh, have his flesh eaten and his hide slip up. Okay, so this one definitely it's a rhetorical. Uh, so if I hate somebody a lot, I will say I wish I have his flesh eaten and uh, I have his hide, his skin slip up. Okay, so I think that's totally rhetorical. But uh, Lu Xun just mix all this together. So this madman. He start to look at and he say, hey, the historical, the medicine book talking about this, right? It's human flesh and the historical account and talking about exchange some to eat. And then we have a common saying said like uh, have his flesh eaten and his height slept on. And compared to, and that explained, you know, it's not just my suspicion because he read the ancient teaching between the, uh, morality and the virtue, it's between the world. They say it people, it people. So that's the evidence that's he, he, he see so far. And then chapter six become very short. Okay. And he talk, I think that's important. He talked about the, the 
fierceness of a lion, the timidity of a rabbit, the craft, the craftiness, I think the right word, jiaohua, I think she'll translate as sleekness, okay, of a fox. So he's talking about this, or you want to translate as a cunning, okay, of a fox. So he's talking about this society become only three kinds of people, the predator, the prey, and the fox. So you, just like we talked about at the beginning, uh, Lu Xun's family, he's a predator, okay? He's uh, uh, the local gentry family. So they, like a lion, or if you are not, you are like a rabbit. Otherwise, you just outside this society, you just try to become sleek and then try to take advantage on that, on, on this society. So that's his diagnosis of the Confucius society during that time. So when he move on, he start to reflection, had some reflection on the cannibalism, right? So. Here, he start to talk about the, oh, he's knowledgeable, he's definitely not mad, right? He talk, uh, well, he's, he talk about how does, other than the historical account, how does man become man eater? So actually he has a good concept about the uh, evolution, right? So he start to talk about, uh, the old time, probably the beast will eat beast, and the blah blah blah. He start to and he start to talk up, realize he read, uh, called uh, hyena. Okay, and he know hyena is kind of the canine species, and related to wolf, and then dog is like this. So he remind him about the, uh, the dog in uh Zhao family's dog. Why the family, the dog, look at him in this way? Because they relate to hyena. In the foreign book, also talk about hyena, they eat the dead flesh. So that all explain the scientific evidence. Okay, this guy, a man eat it. So he start to curse this kind of behavior. Okay, his reflection. So in cursing man eater, I should start with my brother because his brother is a man eater. And he tried to dissuade his brother, man eater, I want to start from him. He has the idea, he want to change it. So chapter eight, he start to talking about the, he, want, he tried to, so remember, he look at the ancient account between the words, the virtue and the morality, he see it people. And in the histo historical account, they have the hard evidence. They say, exchange sun to eat. The medical book talk about it's a human flesh. Scientific evidence, the hyena is that flesh. The dog are related. They all belong to the canine species. Okay, so they eat people. Okay, so he tried to find more evidence. That's check around. He's a very scientific person. He checked the history, check everything. Then he want to be more empirical. He want to ask person, he find a stranger. He ask, ask, just find a stranger, say, hey, is that right to eat human being? Okay. And the answer is, well, there's no famine. Why you eat human being? Well, I think if you go outside to ask people, so is that right to eat human being? They say, no, 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 are you crazy? No, people didn't say that. People say, oh, there's no. And they start to talk about the weather. Oh, today is fine. So they try to avoid um, this kind of question. So okay, the, the reality is that people don't want to talk to the madman. So, so nah, that's why. But he, he, he start to fight. That's the evidence, right? And then, um, and then he start to realize, OK, this society really a man it is society. So he opened his eye widely. He he said he must have been taught how the or here he start to talk about the children. Okay, okay. So they must be taught by their parents. And I'm afraid he has already taught his son 
this is why even the children look at me so fiercely on the second chapter. Uh, even the children, okay, suppose should be naive, but even look at him fiercely because they, they have been taught by their parents. So keep move on on chapter nine. I think this one also important. He's talking about it's a conspiracy, okay? And then he talk about the relationship, a father, son, husband, wife, brother, friends, teacher, student, a sworn enemy, and even student strangers have all joined in this conspiracy discouraging and preventing each other from taking this step. What he's talking about, he's talking about any kind of re relationship, even with your enemy. They even don't want to cross over this line. Which line? Well, I will assume it's a Confucius teaching. If you pass this line, then you will be eaten. Okay. So that's his conclusion. He find out in this way. Then we move on in the 10, and then this one is much longer, but uh, they start have a few uh, 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 conversation talking about. Okay, he also find the, uh, not only in the history, find the more evidence. Okay. Uh, he talk about evolution, right? People from the primary people, they eat people fresh, blah, blah, blah. Then he talk about, he goes through the history. That's the nature evolution. He talk about, oh, probably that's evolution. And to this moment, probably uh, some people, some, some people eat people, some people don't eat, but you know, you should not eat. He still think this way. And he look at the Chinese history, he talk about, Yiya, uh, that's the true in history. Yiya is the person who boiled his son to feed his emperor. Okay, so he talk about, okay, that's uh, the evidence through the history to recent time, Xu Qi, Xu Xi Lin, that's his contemporary around, I think 1900, 1910, he's a revolutionary and he failed and being caught by the government. And I think the soldier kill him, take out his heart and uh, eat his heart. That's the recent, uh, uh, well not, when I say recent, that's con uh, Lu Xun's contemporary. And then during that time, uh, Chinese people also believe some medicine practice. They, they think you soak the uh, bread with the uh, blood with the, uh, the criminal's blood when they are executed, okay? You soak the bread with the blood and you can, uh, that can, that uh, blood and the bread, bread and the blood, okay? And that's different kind of uh, Eucharist, okay? Can cure the uh, uh, consumption, okay? So that's all kind of evidence he has. So he start to uh, uh, think that's the terrible situation. And then, you know, he tried to convince his older brother, you know, uh, man eating is wrong, we should not eat man, this kind of thing. And then people got, you know, and the, his brother just wanted to push him back, lock him back to the room. So the, the interesting is his brother, there's people surrounding to look at him. Uh, to the uh, uh, his uh, man, man, uh, neurosis. So the brother say, what is the point of looking at a madman? I said, don't. So Chinese, they, they don't use madman as a Kuangzen. Okay, Lu Xun carefully choose the words. Fongs, that means is a uh, mentally ill person. Okay, so his brother view him as mentally ill. Then he realized, okay, he realized the one thing people call him madman or uh, neurosis because just stigmatize, okay? Or just give it his name. So they have an excuse to kill him. So in the future, he was eaten, I was eaten, not only will they, uh, there will be no trouble, but people will say probably that's greater for me, okay? So, so 
and uh, he remember, you know, when the tenant, okay, basically the tenant here, he talked about the uh, equivalent to the sharecropper, okay, uh, the poor people. They talk about neighboring village, they eat some bad people. So he realized they just call the person bad people, so they have the excuse to eat them, and same as people call him uh, 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 a neurosis. So, uh, Uh, the neurosis, so they have a good excuse to uh, kill him and uh, eat him. So finally, he talked, uh, you should change, he tried to convince, I think he tried to uh, convince his brother, you should change at once, change from the bottom of your breast. You must know that in the future, there will be no place for man eater, you know, he tried very hard to convince his brother Okay, and then, uh, so then he start to think about his family. He is reminded when he think back, he, he go, he, this person is very thorough, you put it this way. He realized something, look around, check the history, check the scientific evidence and uh, do the empirical experiment, find a stranger to ask. And he realized he, Think about the historical account in nature evolution. Think about in uh, Chinese history. And then he look at his family, okay? His brother is man eater. He remember his younger uh, sister was died when he, she was five years old. So she start to suspect my sister was eaten by my brother. But I don't know whether my mother realized it. So the mother probably know, and then the mother has no way to reject it, has to do it. So here he could be, could be talking about the foot biting practice for the young girl. Okay? And then he start to reflect. And then, uh, uh, so basically he's very logic. So if you eat one piece of, uh, human flesh, you can eat a whole, okay? And he also realized one thing, one practice, that's why this is the Xiao, the filial piety practice, that's an ancient story called Ge Gu Liao Qin, say uh, that when your mother or your parents are sick, you should cut a piece of your meat to eat because it will cure them. So that's a, a saying, okay, about um, a cut off your meat to fit your parent is tell you how much, how important. So he finds this one, he say, that's terrible. That's the society is. So everybody is man heater. So his conclusion is, part. so he start to realize he probably part of them because when his sister died, his brother eat, he also eat meat. So he probably also eat his sister's flesh unwittingly. And right now it's my turn being eaten. So he look at the wrong, he said 4,000 years, his uh, tradition of cannibalism, you know, it's terrible. So conclusion, very short, okay. He said, perhaps there are still children who have not eaten men, save the children. So in Chinese, I think it's Chinese, uh, probably some meaning lost in the, uh, in the uh, English translation. Chinese is say, jiu jiu hai zi. Okay, I think that's very um, heavy cry on that. It would be similar to the last or well, similar to the last word of uh, Gogol's uh, uh, Mad, the Diary of a Madman. I think finally he called, Mother, Mother, have pity on your child. He talked about himself. But here he said, save the church. It's also reflect on Lu Xun's couplet, right? He talked about, he doesn't care his, uh, his angry look at the sullen finger point to him. He will do whatever he can do to save the children. That's about this now. So I finish the story on this one. It's short and then uh, 
Please comment if you, it's a controversial, but you know, uh, matter please. Yes, well, uh, this has nothing to do with the cannibalism. <laughs> uh, I think it was back on slide 10. Uh, our protagonist was attempting to convince his older brother of something. Yeah. And that actually made me think of uh, one of the Confucian virtues, which is that, or one of the things you're supposed to do, which is that if you see that your elder is doing something wrong, um, that's when it's all right to contradict them and try to convince them onto the right path. Yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Well, it's a very complex situation because when we talk about Confucius, it's many, many different kinds of Confucius. And when we read the Confucius analog, okay, it is very different than what Zhu Xi talk about uh, Confucius. Okay. And if Zhu Xi will be focused a lot, a lot on the Li, which is not ritual, is the uh, principle. So Zhu Xi famously talking about you need to preserve the principle, get rid of human desire, okay? So, and then this kind of uh, logic has been enforced by the government. And, and what Lu Xun is talking about is what he seen the society during that time, okay? After 2000 years of practicing Confucianism, okay? That's his, observation, okay. He didn't provide any solution on that. That's he reflect on what he's seen on that. Very similar to Gogol's writing. He talked about the society, the alienation, okay, as a, a small civil servant, okay. And in the, in the notes, you know, uh, I forget what his job, but basically he, working hard to try to get a high, try to um, uh, get close to the high society, but you know, it's not there. So Lu Xun's writing reflects the time during that time and the, the, that's what he see <coughs> uh, uh, as a Confucianism, as in the being practice in the society become a, Cannibalism, all right. And then personally, I, I can understand the situation, okay, because uh, you, if you reject Confucian teaching, you criticize the Confucian teaching, people look at you in a different way. And your family, your friend, your teacher, the whole society look at you in a different way, okay, because you are different. So I think that's that's the situation, you know. And his famous word become the uh, so-called Li Jiao Chi Ren, okay, the richer eat people or Confucianism eat people, okay. So uh, that's his feeling in when he living in this society. Uh, we have uh, CK and uh, Phil. Yes, in. Some ways, Lu Xin himself was very aristocratic or <laughs> Confucian <laughs> because he was uh, he studied, if I am not wrong, at the Jiangnan Naval Academy uh, for a period of time. Uh, yes, and he was uh, sent to work in an engine room during his course of study, mm -hmm. which he absolutely detested because he considered it beneath uh, a gentleman's uh, duty to work in a, an engine room. Those were for the toiling masses and not for educated men like himself. It was a disgrace to his family, according to how he, uh, he thought at the time. So he was behaving very much like an aristocrat and a Confucian, in and spite of what he, he despite he what, Yeah, that's despite what he was writing about, criticizing the society at the time, but he himself was a product, may perhaps unconsciously, of that time and, and, and of the society. Um, even Lu Xun worked in universities as a, as, as a lecturer and as a, a 
American writer. And as far as I know, he didn't go to the masses to toil with them or to uh, try to reform them. He was uh, working um, in the kind of the stratosphere of intellectuals. So he got a very decent uh, amount of pay from those jobs. You know, he didn't really uh, have to work very hard. Sometimes he only worked three hour days a week. You know, so that, that was a bit of a sinecure. So he, he was behaving very much like a Confucian scholar in well, spite of what he was writing. Uh, I think that when you talk about uh, the first part is before he went to Japan, right? And then when he in Japan, he come back, he start to write this one. So they should be different person, okay, I believe. Okay. And about his uh, will pay something, I, that's, I have no comment on that because I don't know about this part. But I just want to mention when he act as a Confucian uh, scholar, and then that before he, that's the time before he went to Japan. Uh, that, that, that's a different situation. Uh, Phil, please. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think we have to take account of the fact that he started out with, the, with a preface about the history of China and Confucianism and then contrast that with the story. I think that contrast is, is, is showing the fact that he understood the tradition, at, but he understood also the moment, the moment that China is in, uh, that he finally saw the destitution of the poor people. I remember when I was a, a, a student myself at Berkeley, uh, I, I, I read a story by Lu Xun, not this one, but maybe you you know the title. The RQ? About, what? You talk about the RQ, the true story of RQ? No, I don't think it was that. It was it was about a story of a, a very poor man who lived in society and. Uh, Is that you, the uh, the call to arms? Well, he used to go to the bar. Let, let me tell you the story. He used to go to the bar, and then uh, and then they would, because people were poor, the bartender, you know, with the familiar people, he would write down what they owe on a blackboard. And then what happened was, uh, at some point, he kind of disappeared for quite a long time. And so they, you know, they wonder. And then finally, at the end, I thought this was a very important moment. Uh, the bartender finally erased his name from the board. I mean, it was like, in other words, oh, it was, it's not even that the guy didn't come back or maybe even die, but the fact that he now is erased from existence, even from the memory of what it was. It, 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 that moment hit me very profoundly that this guy somehow, because of the system, he not only never existed, he not, he's not, his ledger is not even in in heaven, so to speak. So, 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 so that was uh, that struck me very profoundly because he was talking about the destitution of the people at that time. Yeah, uh, I, I think he talked about the destitution. And the one thing probably not translated very well in this writing: this madman is not a poor person. Okay, so please don't connect to the uh, so-called snobbery society. No, I don't think he's talking about this kind of situation. If you look at this one, he keep talking about the tenant. So that means uh, his family, this madman's family is a gentry family, okay? So he is a landlord, he has a tenant to work for them. So he is not poor, okay? So let's put it this way, okay? Yeah, but, but don't, but... But but I also saw it as as kind of like you know how uh, people in society you know like as Kant says you know like look at the world with rose colored glasses right mm -hmm. yeah happy happy feelings I think he was wearing like what I would call surrealist glasses <laughs> and in a sense he saw the strangeness of the situation and he didn't know how to put it together but he saw beneath that in other words it's more real than reality. You know that he his craziness allowed him to saw beneath uh, not only past the rose colored glasses but beyond reality that covers up what the thing is. So so it seems to me he was partially he he was uh, telling a super reality. That's what surrealism means. 
Okay, uh, thank you. But I, I, I really would like to uh, know more what you, if you read, and I would like you show us, share what your opinion on this reading when you first read this one, because I don't want uh, uh, everything drive, uh, it's driven by my own idea, my understanding. I assume a literature, a novel, should have a multi meaning on that, and then. Uh, 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 depend who you are. And that's why they Lushi didn't write a philosophical essay on this, he write a novel. And that means we will have a different opinion and different reflection on this. Yeah. So uh, Kevin, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jason, quick quick question for you. Uh, I mean, I so probably you, you know, uh, learn the Lushi, this character, I saw, uh, it's in Taiwan, the textbook uh, you learn how his, his article. Oh, no, no. I, 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 uh, Taiwan is totally forbid to, 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 to talk about Lu Xun you know, during my time. Hey. Yeah, because, uh, to be, yeah. Yeah, the, because, uh, because Lu Xun has been highly praised by uh, Kabyushis in China. Okay. Yeah, Mark Salem. Yeah, and then, yeah. of course, because the Chinese hate him and Jiang Kai Xie, uh, Mao Zedong uh, like him and Jiang Kai Xie must be hate him. So, <laughs> so he totally banned this book. And since Jiang Kai Xie banned this book, then become my must read book. So uh, I find it from the underground and uh, uh, black market, pay high price to get this one when I was young. I I have to thank you very much, man. That's uh, I give you two thumbs up, man. That's uh, <laughs> I would say this person, yeah. Other than ideology, he is uh, in the when I was child, yeah. He got so many books from RQ, the true star of RQ. And hey, actually, I would one. say RQ yeah. is much better. Okay, uh, because he's yeah. You better. should yeah. Hmm. For example, in Chinese, listen we we lie down right. Tao Ping those. Uh, culture in the Western Union, it's already exist. So what he described in even this article, you think about it. people eat people. It's a metaphysical, metaphysical way, still exists. <laughs> uh, how, however, I'm going to use uh, the art, the main character, original is from his uh, auntie, the son. It's a very, it's, it, it's a very scholar, smart, educated, but get created code delu. Uh, English is called uh, persecutory delusion. Mm -hmm. That's himself. Mm -hmm. That's that's why the main character, you know, then uh, then uh, they live with Lu Xun, uh, this uh, author. Then he bases that character right. And another way is from audience people the traditional so he like you see it you know from the Li Zizhen, the, uh, and we have a tradition think of something for us can cure other people's uh, uh, disease um, I, I really want is uh, uh, Matu, right kind of let's <laughs> say uh, anyway it's a uh, for, for me the third one from himself, basically anti-traditional. Yeah, it's then plus his previous this article, he just uh, uh, finished his uh, education from Japan for the mm -hmm. you know, modern medicine. So he immediately got a shock. I can't imagine he we, we come back from in Japan. Okay, the traditional something is so doesn't make sense. The people mind and practice is so uh, ridiculous. And first, next guy, I want to uh, introduce a little bit his life. He's, uh, he's I believe, it's arranged marriage with another lady called Zhuan. Yeah. Then that lady leave his um, mom for whole life. For himself, eventually he finds Zhu Lao, romantic from his Zhu Guapi, uh, Xu Guapi. So it's, uh, Basically, his experience of one from the traditional to now new culture uh, uh, movement. Yeah, it's 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 good. It's good, you know, for our self pick up. For me, it's another way. It's, 
we either confuse us to traditional, another way, here's two extreme, where's the right way, balance. It's not, either way is not perfect, but either, either way have something to, for each individual we can learn from it. Thank you. All right, thank you, Kevin. Uh, uh, Madeline, please. Yes, uh, thanks again, Jason. Uh, I've been enjoying everyone's comments as well. I'm thinking about this in terms of the, the larger cultural, let's say, metaphors or archetypes that were operating at that time. So, for example, in our current era, what I see is, I call it the archetype of the flood and of boundaries. So it might be a flood of, of information on the internet with an attempt to create boundaries about it. It might be what people see as floods of immigrants from one country to another with attempts to create boundaries. So on many levels of society, what we have going on right now is a kind of a flood and boundaries archetype. In this, yeah. what I'm seeing is, um, I'd say more of a more of a larger metaphor of breaking taboos and getting contaminated. And um, you know, one of the tab one of the most ancient human taboos, obviously, is cannibalism, but it also might be sort of the opening up of China and the consumption of other cultures or possibly um, other cultures that are too close to you. Um, it might be a criticism of that, but something to do with um, breaking a taboo, consuming what you shouldn't, and then contamination as a result. Contamination seems to be a big deal in this, um, along with, of course, getting the evil eye from the dogs in the dog eat dog world. Yeah, thank you, Madeline. And then, uh, yeah, that's a, another way to look at it. And then I, just like a Gogol's um, uh, novel, it still makes sense, or Kafka's um, uh, writing, it still makes sense, you know, we read today, just like Madeline said, today's internet, uh, uh, the culture, you know, booty, uh, it, it, it also uh, applicable, you know, uh, applicable uh, for, Today's and a different society, you know, really up to how you read this one. Uh, CK, please. I think Lu Xin's uh, depiction of Confucianism as cannibalism in uh, the, this diary of a madman is or was meant to be shocking, was meant <laughs> to be to shock, to like shock and awe the, his readers into waking up to the fact that China was a degenerate society at the time. Yeah. It was a uh, backward. It wasn't able to compete with the advanced uh, states of the world or the advanced civilizations, mostly the West, you know, even Japan's of the world. And that in order to, to survive, it had to wake up. And by do and then one way of waking up it was to be iconoclastic, was to <laughs> attack so-called Confucianism. Uh, the, 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 the choices that the uh, Lu Xin chose, or this, this madman chose as examples of cannibalism uh, was not entirely attributable to Confucianism if one took a forensic view of it. But uh, you know, to, 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 att uh, to attribute them all to Confucianism was probably one way of trying to open up the eyes of his readers whom to what was happening during Chinese society at the time. And some of the, the examples were no, no, doubt, uh, no doubt happened, like uh, the eating of the revolutionaries' uh, heart mm -hmm. and liver. Uh, and uh, there are some examples of like uh, children being exchanged for eating during uh, times of famine in, 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 uh, in, in, uh, in China, China's history. Um, but I think his main purpose was to uh, arouse the, his readers to, to the plight of the society. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, CK. Yeah. Uh, no, no doubt about his, his, his writing. Is, I think his purpose is try to wake up people 
I think that one of his purpose. I remember one of his writing, he talked about, uh, he has a thought experience. He talked about people being dark in the room, that the gas leak, and this guy is sleeping and has no way to out. So whether or not we should wake up this guy, you know, it doesn't matter if he wake up or not wake up, he's dying anyway. So uh, should, should, should we wake up this guy when he's sleeping? So that's another thought experiment, you know, we're thinking about, you know. So if he, I, I don't know what's his answer, but his, I believe his answer is you need to wake up, you know. Uh, Joe, please. Yeah. I don't know how much I can add actually now that everybody has uh, spoken uh, for the most part. Um, but I agree uh, that, you know, the idea of cannibalism was used to, to, uh, to shock the people uh, into understanding that they're maybe part of a system that uh, is not making any kind of real progress. Uh, and specifically, um, if you do think about it there, you know, the idea, it, and, and when we were going through the analects, I was actually thinking something similar, is that yeah, loyalty is important and ritual is important. And, and I, I started to understand that while I really went through it. But I also understood that it could be used as a form of um, stifling any kind of uh, change uh, and any kind of progress as well. Uh, if you're beholden um, only to uh, to the current social structure. And so um, uh, it, it is about, I agree with what Kevin was saying in the sense that it is a balance um, because yes, there, there are, uh, you know, limitations to the way Confucius and, and actually it's stifling at certain points. Um, and it actually makes for, uh, an increasingly unequal society, um, but uh, uh, you know, to, to say there's no room for loyalty when you showed the the car, the virtues that we were you know earlier, you know, mm -hmm. this you know, to kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater. I I think that that's a little extreme, um, and uh, yeah, that's that's just my thought. It was it was. And then, well, and it did shock people. <laughs> so. well, let, me, let me share my personal view on this one. I, 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 I do believe, okay, I do believe. I know a lot of people probably disagree. I do believe uh, Confucianism is cannibalism, okay, in the sense, not in the book of Confucius analog, not in the book of Zhu Xi, even Zhu Xi's writing. I think that exists in the society, a conservative society. Uh, I will make a parable comparison with Christian. If we look at the Bible, that's fine. There's nothing wrong on that. Even all the through the uh, uh, church writing, they all no problem. But if you take in the 15th century, okay. Uh, it's cannibalism. Christian is cannibalism because how many people die being persecuted because of heresy. Okay. And if the people and the worst situation is if, for, if the society still think they are burning people based on justice, that's the problem. So not because of the philosophy I even see Nietzsche's philosophy is great. And then I see even Marquis Tissart's writing is wonderful, but I'm not going to mimic them, but really depend on how you behave. So uh, for me, I see Confucianism is cannibalism, not based on the book, the teaching, I based on what happened during that time. And does all Confucianism's fault? Uh, that, that's another issue. It could be probably Confucian is not guilty about that, but the people practice it, do it the wrong way. So uh, if it, it would comparison would be with the church. I, I appreciate that because I think when it becomes dogmatic, 
Yeah, uh, and, that's, and, that's the problem. Yeah, exactly. Any good uh, teacher, and uh, one example I make a thousand times is about Zhang Kai Shek. Okay, he has he he promote the two greatest culture, Confucian design and the Christian culture. But I don't see any good behavior he is doing. So, so this all de depends on how you are going to behave. Yeah. Uh, oh, we have a lot of hands up, and then oh, let, let, let me extend uh, that. Let's keep the uh, uh, the conversation uh, brief because uh, let's go for Brian. Uh, okay, I have the person who haven't spoke uh, to first Brian and uh, Oga and the CK in the field. Okay, uh, Brian, please. So the <clears throat> I really do. A uh, agree, appreciate and agree what really everyone has said. The one uh, word that pops in my mind is uh, trust. And the thrust of this book might be for the reader is to undermine trust in traditional relationships. Because this, this person has, uh, through his psychosis, has lost trust in all the traditional relationships. It's just each chapter is uh, talking about one relationship after another. The uh, and I think I can see then why Mao might like this book because he's that was his uh, project was to uh, change the traditional relationships. And Mao and uh, Chiang Kai Shek, I guess, would not like this book because he wants to preserve. <laughs> the trust in traditional relationships. That's that's all that struck me. Yeah, uh, thank you. No. Uh, oh, uh, Olga, please. Um, hi. Now, first, I would like to say that in Bible, we also have cannibalism. When woman <laughs> went to, David went to the wall and the woman said, it was uh, during this age, a woman said, Yesterday we ate my son, but today this woman didn't give her son to eat to us, but we agreed. So what to do? So it's even in Bible, but in all societies and all traditional societies was the sacrifice and everything. It's, it's not just in China, but what I wanted to say, it's of course, it's like um, I don't know, sarcastic, in like what in Russian, for example, call it black humor, and Gogol has this kind of humor in his writing. And uh, <clears throat> so, so, and right now what, what we have, we have this uh, uh, South Park show Pro probably people watch sometimes on tv the show that kind of humor that people eat if we follow really follow confuse confucius then philosophy then we actually it's really good um <clears throat> re really good uh, uh no how to say directions to how to to eat each other. That's that's probably something like this. From my point of view, it's it's it, from my point of view, it's hilarious. But I'm not sure how it's from China point of view, Chinese point of view. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. You know, and then even in Bible, right? You if you want to pick the cannibalism, the, you you don't want to learn from the Abraham to sacrifice your son, you know, to God. So uh, really depend on how you do it. And uh, pretty soon, I'm, when I introduce the six Chinese classic novel, one is the uh, Plum in the Golden Vase, that's totally pornography, okay? What are we going to learn from the pornography? So, you know, it's not the author's fault, basics. You know, it really depends uh, how you want to practice, right? Uh, with a CK fear, uh, okay. Uh, Fred and the Rob. Okay, then we, we have to close this one. And remember, uh, next week I have no meeting and we will go back and then um, on the eighth, okay, Bakabakita, and then we will continue. And then uh, we'll focus more on the uh, sixth novel or five novel, okay, uh, because one, I, I'm asking Pin to do it for me because he is much more familiar with that novel, uh, The Scholar. Rudy and Weiss. 
um, then we'll talk about more on Zhuangzi, seven chapters, inner chapter. <clears throat> okay, uh, Phil, please. Uh, you know, I, I, I was struck by uh, what, when you begin the meeting, you show a timeline. Okay. And uh, in the timeline, the Qing dynasty actually lasted pretty long in relation oh, yeah. to other dynasty. It's not the longest, but it's pretty long. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that in, in that, when I looked at it very carefully, there was no major figures that in a sense emerge, uh, which means that there was not enough input and criticism of the culture. So it was a decline. Certainly it was a decline. Uh, it, was, it, was a, it became a decadent society. The other thing I want to mention is taking that into view is that in a sense, I I never took the story to be literal. It was metaphorical. And the cannibalism there was the cannibalism of the spirit of mankind. Because mm -hmm. if you don't have an input into it, you're not free. And, and particularly, and I criticize uh, even Confucius to a degree, because even though the the bad part appears in the manifestation of the ideas rather than the ideas themselves. However, when you have an ideology that in a sense, particularly with a consolidation that just didn't have new input, what happened is it becomes so easily manifested in, in the decadence that in a sense begin to strangle people's spirit. And that's the cannibalism. Is the cannibalism of the human spirit that uh, was manifested. And that's why people were destitute because uh, they had no, there was a lack of hope. There was a lack of, uh, you know, moving ahead and even sustaining oneself. So th there was a dual, a dual kind of cannibalism of the spirit and the physical uh, 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 manifestation of that in terms of not providing the kind of livelihood and existence that people had. So it, it was entirely a metaphorical thing that you have to see beneath the thing. And, 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 and obviously uh, what lies behind that is the decadence uh, does actually lead to the decline of the, uh, of the, the system itself. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you, Phil. Yeah. Uh, CK, please. The way I see it, one of the ways I see this uh, story is that it is the one of the starting points for the attack on on Chinese culture uh, throughout Chinese communities, particularly on um, in mainland China. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with this uh, this this kind of iconoclastic uh, approach at, or approaches is that after attacking. Chinese culture throughout uh, like the 4,000 years or 2,500 years or 5,000 years, however you want to count it. Um, after endless and ceaseless attacks, what is there left? You know, it is easy to destroy, but very difficult to put back and reconstruct what keeps a culture or civilization together. And this this road eventually led to nihilism, and that we we saw uh, the, some of the worst excesses during the Cultural Revolution, which could uh, may perhaps be traced to the it could trace its origins to 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 uh, to the uh, New Cultural Movement or, uh, or or the May Fourth Movement. Uh, I'm not saying it is a direct result, but it is a it is a possible offspring. It is an offspring of that kind of movement. So what I'm saying is once you start relentlessly attacking your own culture and we're not putting back, and, and I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a necessary process to, to uh, prevent the ossification of a civilization, to open it up. But once you break it down completely without, uh, without any regard for, for its value, then the, the people and, 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 and the civilization itself is endangered. And what makes a person Chinese then? You know, if it, everything is the West. So that's the question, right? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, but uh, we don't have any, we don't need to have five days. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so we need to close this one soon. Uh, Fred and uh, Roth. 
Oh, oh Pioled, you know, uh, 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 Ogla uh, uh, talk about is a human. Do, do you think this writing is a humorous? Okay, I think it's quite humor. Okay, so I don't know. <laughs> Probably after translation is not that humor, but in Chinese, I think his tone is a humorous. So when I was, I think I read it when I was 16, uh, I think it's a fun to read it. And I didn't get the, the deep information. I just see the all society as a confusion society. So it talked to my heart during that time. And so that's my idea. Uh, Fred, please. I thought it was humorous in a sick way, <laughs> which, which is my favorite kind of humor. Uh, so yeah, I, I enjoyed it. And I particularly liked your interpretation and your relationship of it to, to Google. Um, and, and because I never would have would have gathered all the insights that that you you brought out about it unless you explained it, Jason. But that was really really useful. Uh, and also the interesting is the, the the criticism or acceptance of that sat satire. It seems to me that in general. Uh, the lesson of satire is that if you're authoritarian regime, which extols the virtue of satire against the prior regime, be careful because sooner or later that satire will be directed against you. <laughs> and that's certainly true with Google, as I recall, his relationship with the Soviets. Yeah. And uh, initially, uh, they took it as a satire of the czarist regime, but pretty quickly it was uh, banned and suppressed. But then in 1945, or at least as I recall, sometime shortly around the, the end of World War II, then all of a sudden they, they flipped 180 degrees and Gogol was extolled as this great writer because there was a wave of nationalism. But then with the Stalinist trials, Google was suppressed again, and then he was extolled again. And, and, um, and I gathered from what you and others have said is, is that, uh, that he, this, this writer is uh, lauded by the, uh, the mainland Chinese Communist Party. Mm -hmm. But boy, from some of those tales, true stories I have of, of that, that I've read about actually pretty humorous uh, Kafka-esque uh, situations in communist China today certainly seem like it would be uh, a criticism uh, that you could take it as a criticism of current conditions in mainland China. So I, I wonder if, if uh, if it will turn, the, the attitudes will turn towards him again, uh, the, the author again, and he'll be um, repressed or criticized. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I, my opinion would be that just leave the uh, novel as a novel, and everyone, you know, have your own interpretation, and they, and just enjoy it. That's all. and uh, I I I I specifically like the uh, Google's notes. Okay, I think that one is a wonderful, wonderful story. And if, if I recommend the kids to read it. And uh, uh, I think it's uh, old people, you still can read it and they have a different uh, idea on that. Uh, Ralph, you have the closing statement. Please. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'd like to just draw a bit of a parallel. I think a common feature of this work along with American works and European works of the earliest 20th century, and um, this being an era of democracy and hence of the common man, mm -hmm. that the characters in this work are all totally ordinary. There's no hierarchy. Um, there really, there's no, as I say, it's against the, conf there seems to be no aspect of the Confucianist social structure. Um, parents, children, older brothers, younger brothers. There's no particular hierarchy. These are simply ordinary people. Um, so this was the age of, of democracy when, when people were, when 
the idealistic political or human human let's call it humanism uh concept where everybody was equal and there was no um uh hierarchy um I would it reminds me a bit of a work of around the same period um Bertolt Brecht's man is man mm -hmm. And there you get the title contains these various things. Man is man is often title is often trans can be translated as man equals man. That is all human beings are equal. Um, a man's a man, just human nature is what it is. But it also, uh, but ist is also a homophobe for the verb essen to eat. Man ist man also homophonically means man eats man um which was of course a mark brecht was a marxist and this was a revolutionary idea of uh, that this was also a characteristic of of modern times and well and even of all times that uh yeah people eat people and this is uh people consume other people and this was just a common metaphor of the time in china europe the us everywhere thanks all right thank you thank you raf good uh, closing and then uh thank you and then enjoy your weekend and then uh, uh, in, uh next quarter april uh we will have a new series uh, on that so looking forward to Seeing everybody and have a nice screen holiday. Thank Bye. you. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye.